Okay, welcome to our second edition of the Gong Show. Uh, if you are a Gong Show speaker, please uh, come forward to the front part of the auditorium. And um, if you are a speaker, you will see the countdown clock uh, here in this computer down, down here. So you can look here and see how much time you have. Okay, with all these announcements, I now leave you with uh, Lars uh, Alsma, who's our first speaker. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lars Alsma. I'm from the University of Amsterdam. And today I will tell you about a universal black hole instability and its relation to this beautiful landscape. And if you're interested, you can find the reference to the paper on the left bottom. All right, so let's start. So it turns out that over the last years, that quantum gravity is more constraining at lower energies than what was previously thought. So if you think about this pictorially, what this means, that if we look at all the possible effective field theories at low energies, only a subset of them, known as the landscape, are UV completed into quantum gravity. Its complement, known as the swampland, consists of seemingly consistent effective field theories, but they cannot be consistently coupled to quantum gravity. And over the years, several swampland conjectures have been proposed in order to chart the boundaries between the landscape and the swampland. And today, I would like to focus on a particular one known as the weak gravity conjecture. And in its simplest form, it's just a statement that any consistent theory of quantum gravity should contain a particle whose mass over its charge is smaller or equal than one. And if this is true, this implies that extremal black holes, despite the fact that their Hawking temperature is zero, can decay by emitting these particles. <coughs> and furthermore, by taking a near horizon limit of such an extremal black hole, this would also imply that the near horizon ADS2 space is unstable. Uh, and this has been taken as evidence, along with other arguments, that every non-supersymmetric anti-decider space should be unstable. And our goal for today is to derive this decay rate of the black hole for four-dimensional horizon and Nordstrom black holes and see what this implies. All right, so what we did, if you just think about Hawking's ordinary calculation, we find that black holes do not radiate when their temperature goes to zero, and hence, extremal black holes should not have an instability. But this is not the full story when we include back reaction. So what we do is we include back reaction to Hawking's calculation by imposing energy and charge conservation. What we then find is a modification of Hawking's result. And in order to compute the uh, emission spectrum of the black hole, we take the, similar to Hawking's computation, we take the Bogolyubov transformation between an observer that dives into the black hole, which sees the Unruh vacuum state, and an observer at asymptotic infinity, which sees the Minkowski vacuum state. And the result is the following. So if you look at the expectation value of the number operator, if we would not have included back reaction, we would have found the following result. And notice this uh, beta there, which is the inverse Hanke temperature. So we indeed find that we would uh, not find black hole radiates, radiance if we take the extremal limit. However, what we did is we did include back reaction, and now we find that this exponential factor is modified. And it is modified in order in, <coughs> it is modified in such a way that it is the difference in black hole entropy before and after emission of this charged particle. And interestingly, we can take different limits of this result uh, in such a way that it describes both Hawking radiation, swinger pair production, and also an instability known as superradiance. And furthermore, our goal for today was to look at extremal black holes. And indeed, because the entropy of an extremal black hole is finite, we can now take the extremal limit of this expression. And then also, by taking a near horizon extremal limit, we find an instability of the near horizon ADS2 space uh, that agrees in a particular limit with earlier uh, results known in the literature for ADS2. And now we have a nice universal expression that also applies for non-extremal black holes. So to come to the conclusions, what we did is we derived the emission rate for extremal black holes, but we furthermore also had a decay rate that also applies to non-extremal black holes. And we did this by including back reaction of the particles in the spherically symmetric sector. And this yielded a universal expression in the sense that it just only depends on the black hole entropy difference. And by assuming the weak gravity conjecture to be two, true, this implies indeed that the near horizon anti-decider space is unstable. Uh, and we expect that our results should also hold for higher dimensional black holes uh, and higher dimensional black range. So this decay rate might also hold for higher dimensional and to the center space. Thank you very much.
photon radiation, we don't get purely the, this Bose factor, but also some uh, gray body factor? Yes, that's correct. Why, why did you get that? So in principle, we also did get that, because we only just focus on the effect of uh, basically the probability of emission and the other uh, horizon. So if you would take the full result to propagate it in order to spatial infinity, we would have to take into account the gray body factor. Sorry? Do you mean to say that there are instabilities in higher dimensions? Yeah. But in the, uh, is it the same instability as what uh, was started in the higher dimensions with the paper that you cited? I thought it's because that area is still like two boundaries, like this measure boundary, and that's why it was unstable. So for a higher dimensional enter the sitter space, if it's non supersymmetric, so that's an important uh, ingredient in this you can still find a similar effect. It's basically swing a pair production, but then higher dimensional enter the sitter space. So it does not really depend on having two disconnected boundaries. So. Right is previous, left, or no, right is next. Left is previous, then okay. it is laser pointer. Which one is the pointer? It's, it's, it's right above. No, it's right below that. It's here. Right here. OK, thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to speak. I'm going to talk about JT bar deformed CFT2 and the dual string theory, the work done in collaboration with Amit Givon and David Kutasov. So let us start with a CFT2 on a cylinder that has a conserved U1 left current J of H. We deform the CFT2 by this operator. Um, mu JT bar, where T bar is the anti-holomorphic component of the stress tensor. This deformation breaks Lorentz invariance. The coupling mu here is irrelevant because it has dimension 0, minus 1. The main motivation for studying such a problem is that deformations of this form may shed light on black hole physics. So initially, we had a CFT2 with two copies of Virasoro. Upon deformation, the right, left-handed Virasoro remains unbroken. The right-handed Virasoro gets broken to some U1 null corresponding to some shift in some null direction. And on top of that, we have the U1 left affine symmetry. Now, exact results in string theory predict that one can define the theory in such a way that along the line of the deformation, there is a holomorphic stress tensor, there is a holomorphic current J of X, and the quantity T minus half J squared, which we call T coset, is independent of mu. We showed that it's indeed possible to define the theory in such a way and calculate the exact spectrum. So on the string theory side, let us start with type 2 superstrings on ADS 3 times S3 times T4 with NSN as B field. The, the boundary CFT in a Raman vacuum corresponds to massless BTZ in the bulk. Uh, the background is made out of fundamental strings and NS5 brains, and these are all BPS objects, which implies that there is a flat potential, which in turn implies that there is a continuum of states corresponding to strings moving radially away from the five brains. These states are described by symmetric orbifold CFT, where N here is the number of fundamental strings, and M, you can realize this as a CFT associated with one single string. The jetty bar deformation of this individual block, CFTM, uh, is single trace. And using ADS CFT dictionary, one can show that the single trace JT bar induces on the worldsheet a truly marginal deformation uh, of this form. It's a current current deformation, and hence exactly solvable, where K is a U1 left moving current coming from the CFT here, and JSL bar minus is a right moving now SL2R current coming from uh, the uh, CFT living in uh, SL2R. We just study the worldsheet symmetry on uh, ADS 3 times S1. So we start with uh, the sigma model on massless BTZ and deform it by KSL bar minus. Initially, to start with, we had two copies of SL2R left and right. Upon deformation, the, the left remains unbroken. The right gets broken to U1 null. And uh, the, four, the, the background upon reduction to three, three dimensions takes this particular form, which is popularly known as uh, warped ADS. And one can calculate the spectrum exactly. Let me flash a few equations. So this is the def Lagrangian in the deformed theory. Uh, to calculate spectrum in this, uh, in this theory means uh, you need to perform some calculations similar to those done in uh, Narayan spectrum uh, in toroidal compactifications. Uh, in the background, G and B. These are the vertex operators. These are the dimensions of the vertex operators. Uh, and using ADS CFT dictionary, one can construct the, space, the uh, spectrum which takes this form. In the sector winding equals one, this is the spectrum. This is the charge, the U1 charge. And in the uh, winding, when, in the case winding greater than one, the spectrum corresponds to the ZW twisted sector of the symmetric or before CFT. So we compute the spectrum of this uh, GITI bar deformed symmetric or before CFT and found that there is an exact agreement with the string theory uh, calculations. 
once we identify the couplings of the two theory in this particular way. So as far as further works are concerned, we would like to, okay, you can read this out, and let me thank you for, uh, uh, for, for listening. <laughs> What happens is that, I'm not an expert in this, but as the story goes, uh, extremal, extremal uh, care of black holes, if you go to the near horizon limit, uh, the near horizon extremal care uh, takes this guy, the, the, the background is what <coughs> ADS. So if we can understand holography in this non ADS background, it may shed some light on, uh, on black hole physics. And uh, people have worked on uh, something which is called care CFT, which, is, uh, which also needs to do with with black holes and uh, something that condensed metal like, condensed metal physicists like the Schrodinger space time, dipole CFT, which I'm not very familiar with. We, get, we hope that this, is, this will shed some light. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you to the organizers. I'm Dan Kappas, and I'll discuss this paper that I wrote with Prahar Mitra. Uh, so here's the basic idea. In an asymptotically flat space-time, uh, out near the boundary, the Lorentz group acts as the conformal transformations of the celestial sphere. And massless particles, which enter or exit the space-time through null infinity, do so at isolated points on that sphere. So if you are a very optimistic person, you might hope to somehow rewrite the massless S matrix in D plus two dimensions in terms of a collection of correlators, d-dimensional correlators with local operator insertions at the points where the particles enter or exit the space time. If you manage to do that, then the Lorentz covariance of the S matrix would guarantee for you that those operators transformed appropriately under the Euclidean conformal group. So all of that is just to say that you might expect the massless S matrix in D plus two dimensions to uh, display some, but not necessarily all, of the properties of a D-dimensional Euclidean conformal field theory. So we'd like to test that idea out and gather some evidence for it. The correlators will, in general, be model dependent, but you can say some general things about them based on universal properties of the S matrix. So to be concrete, I'll uh, parameterize the momenta of massless particles in this way. This x is basically a coordinate on the transverse space-like cuts of scry. Uh, so it basically tells you the point at which the, the particle pierces the boundary. And then I'll rewrite the uh, scattering amplitudes in this suggestive way. And then using techniques familiar from the embedding space formalism, you can show uh, that these operators transform as conformal primaries. So let's do an example. One a very important property of the S matrix is its behavior in the soft limit. So when we take the wavelength of a photon or a graviton to be very large, it's not able to resolve short distance scattering processes. So the amplitude uh, with the soft insertion in this limit factorizes into some soft operator acting on a reduced amplitude without the soft insertion. Now the soft operator is universal and model independent, and the factorization is very reminiscent of a ward identity. So, for instance, in my notation, the soft uh, photon theorem takes this form. It's some sum of kinematic factors weighted by U1 charges of the asymptotic states. So if I define a soft photon operator, which basically projects onto the leading uh, Weinberg pole in the soft limit, I can calculate its matrix elements using the soft theorem, and it has a very simple form. So if we follow our nose, ordinarily, if we have a gauge theory in the bulk, we get some global symmetry in the boundary theory, so we might hope to find some conserved boundary current. If we did, it would satisfy the usual uh, ward identity. And it's not quite the soft photon theorem, but it is related, because if I multiply both sides of the equality by the derivative of a logarithm and then take the integral, uh, the right-hand side will produce for me exactly the matrix element of the soft operator. And the left-hand side, I can integrate by parts and massage into this interesting non-local integral transform of the conserved current. So this integral transform is actually well known. It's called the shadow transform. Uh, and it squares to the identity up to a numerical factor. 
So if you have a gauge theory in the bulk, you give for free the soft photon operator, you take its shadow transform and you automatically get a conserved boundary current. So that, that sounds like a familiar story. Uh, and as you might suspect, uh, when you turn on gravity, you can consider a particular soft graviton operator. His shadow transform obeys all of the word identities of an energy momentum tensor in a d-dimensional uh, Euclidean conformal field theory. So these things sort of work out the way that you might have hoped. So I'll stop there. Another direction where people try to use ADS, which is this uh, old story due to Debor and Solodukin, where you try to foliate uh, Minkowski with Euclidean ADS inside the light cone. Yeah, but I, I don't know the answer. It sounds like it might be. Yeah, it would be an interesting. Um, all right, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Sam, I'm from MIT, uh, and I'm gonna talk to you about this effective field theory for one-form symmetries uh, that I'm developing here with uh, Sasha Groznov, Hong Lu, and Shreya Vartan. Um, so first, uh, what are one-form symmetries? Well, basically, these are global symmetries in which our charged operators, instead of being these points, these local operators, they have support, um, they have support on a co-dimension one manifold, so lines like this. Um, and they give rise to a two-form conserved current, um, and then they it obeys these equations just like this here. Um, and the reason I put this one here is just to, to point out to you that there's a, a charge density here that's actually a vector, um, and it's a divergenceless vector in particular. Um, and so uh, how are we gonna develop an effective field theory for this one-form symmetry? Well, there's been a lot of work recently on developing effective field theory frameworks for conserved currents. Um, and in our case, it turns out that the effective field theory degree of freedom is this emergent gauge field, which I'll call A mu. Um, and so, you know, using the usual effective field theory uh, idea of identifying degrees of freedom and the symmetries, uh, we've been able to systematically develop an action for A mu. Um, and so the first thing that I'll mention is uh, something that sort of supports the story of the photon as the Goldstone boson. So in the effective field theory, uh, we apply different symmetries depending on whether or not this um, one-form symmetry is spontaneously broken. And in the case that we do spontaneously break this symmetry, um, at lowest order, we find exactly this Maxwell action. Um, and this is sort of providing some evidence that the photon uh, as the Goldstone boson of this broken symmetry. Um, and then in the case that the symmetry is preserved, we always see these conserved quantities diffusing. Um, and there's a, a lot of interesting diffusion phenomena that happen uh, because of the vector nature of this charge. It's, it's a little bit different. So what I've drawn here um, is basically you have an initial charge density. It's a vector, so it's pointing along the Z, uh, the Z direction. And then it sort of spreads out cylindrically like this with some diffusion uh, constant. And uh, in the case that you turn on a background charge density, this uh, you know, charge density is also a vector, and so it actually breaks the spherical symmetry. Um, and so what I've drawn here is suppose that I have a charge density, a background charge density along the z-axis, then I've, I've broken the symmetry and I get this sort of elliptical anisotropic uh, diffusion. And there's also some other interesting things going on, like we've found a complex diffusion constant and there are still lots of phenomena to be explored. It's still certainly a uh, work in progress. Um, and so finally, just as the, the outlook and goals of this program, is there are many more uh, hydrodynamical behaviors that we think we, we can get uh, from this effective field theory. Uh, you know, at least I would like to understand better this uh, breaking of the higher form symmetry. Um, and then in the case that you take uh, the, the U1 theory and you look in the symmetry preserving phase, it should give a, a systematic formulation of magneto hydrodynamics. Um, and so that was what I wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah. Can you 
Um, so, so yeah, we haven't uh, uh, investigated uh, many, many different forms of the background yet, so I, I definitely can't say anything concretely about that. Yeah. So, so in in, in general, yeah, it, it, it is uh, in the in the U1 case, and when you, when you do ENM, it is it is like a, a magnetic flux, and um, in particular in this paper here, uh, where they sort of develop MHD from these conserved currents, that's exactly how they think of it. Hello everyone, my name is uh, well, yes, Rashmish Mishra, and I'm going to tell you today about something, uh, some exciting connections that we are exploring between asymptotic symmetries and holography. Uh, this is work done with my collaborators, Raman Sundram and Arif Mohammed, and this is based on the following paper which is published, and another one which should be out soon. So I don't have to tell you, to tell to this audience what, what holography is, but uh, let me quickly remind you what I mean by asymptotic, or what, what is meant by asymptotic symmetries. Uh, Daniel Kepek already gave a talk on this. So uh, asymptotic symmetries, at least in the context of 4D asymptotically flat space-time, are infinite dimensional symmetries of gauge theory and gravity. And historically, they were uh, discovered by looking for coordinate transformations which preserve the asymptotically flat space-time. Um, and in, in the process, uh, it was found, uh, the, this is given the name BMS uh, symmetries, it was found that uh, you didn't just get, say, for example, translations, but you got an infinite set of them called super translations, and later people found super rotations and so on. The, the modern understanding of these things comes from uh, the soft theorems, which are universal features in quantum field theories and the IR structure of scattering matrices. And, uh, and because there are infinite dimensional symmetries, uh, again, which relates to the talk that Kepe gave, at least in the context of 4D space-time, there's a 2D CFE-like structure seen at least uh, in, the, in the context of massless particle scattering. And I want you to pay attention to the flow of uh, arrow where this, is, this was found first and then it, it went in, the, in, in this direction. Now, at the same time when this, uh, this work was uh, known, one of my collaborators showed that it's actually possible to go the other way around, where you start with a 2D CFT, where, we, where you try to find a 2D CFT-like structure and uh, cast it into asymptotic symmetries of flat space. And since this is the one relevant for my talk, so I want to tell you two things relevant in this direction. And I think this connects to the question that Lenny was asking. So, the approach in this is to, to foliate uh, Minkowski space into Euclidean ADS3 and, and then use ADS3 CFT2. And, and in this approach, the soft photon leg in the soft limit, for example, becomes a churn simons line. Uh, and churn simons lines on, on a manifold with boundary are known to have, uh, give you holomorphic currents on, on the boundary degrees of freedom. So, so I want to keep these two things uh, manifest. And I want to ask the question, can we use the second path, the one in green, where the first path obscures the approach? And uh, why would there even be a hope? It turns out that in the, in the case of ADS3, these two approaches uh, align very well. So if you ask the same question of looking for, for example, uh, coordinate transformations, which keep the space-time asymptotically ADS3, you get the whole bit of solar charges with the right central charge and so on. So anyway, uh, to flash quickly and not uh, give you too much details, we consider two examples where I want to keep the, the holography, sorry, and the churn simons part explicit. The first thing we considered is uh, 3D CFT on, on ADS3, uh, plus a weak churn simons gauging, and it turns out that this projects half of ADS4 over 2, um, and uh, when, when all the dust, so, so using ADS3 and CFT2, you can see some kind of CFT2 op operators and CFT2 charges and so on, and it turns out to correspond to some restricted set of correlators in the ADS4 space. Uh, there's a second example, but I'm just going to flash it, which is to consider CFT3 on 3D mink space. And here you have to look at the wave functional uh, at a fixed time slice. And in both these cases, you see some aspect of infinite dimensional symmetries arising. 
Uh, it turns out that you can even make the churn Simons explicit requirement go away, at least in the U1 case, by requiring SL2Z on, on, on the CFT, which relates to the electromagnetic duality in the areas four. And uh, <coughs> so, so to kind of give you the big picture, in the areas three, these two approaches go hand in hand. And uh, in Minkowski, we saw there is some connection. In areas four, we are trying to explore the other way around. And, and uh, the goal is that the, the big picture we would learn from all of this can maybe help us understand something about flat space holography. Thank you. Right is advanced, left is previous, and then this button is always Oh, okay. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to give a talk here. I'll be talking about black hole one loop determinant in large dimension limit based on my ongoing work with Cynthia Keeler. Uh, so uh, the goal of the project is to compute one loop partition function for gravitational perturbation around the Schwarzschild black hole in large dimension limit using the quasi-normal mode method proposed by Deneff, Hartnoll, and Suchdev. Um, so uh, let's review what quasi-normal mode method is. So suppose if you have uh, this field equation for a complex scalar field, then partition function is one loop partition function is just one over the determinant of the operator. So how do I apply this method? So you assume that the partition function is a meromorphic function of the mass parameter. And then you let the mass parameter wander in the complex plane and then find poles and zeros, which are basically those mass parameter values that solves the equation of motion and uh, satisfies the boundary condition and the periodicity constraint. Uh, once you have found all the poles and zeros, uh, uh, you can use Weierstrass factorization theorem to write down the partition function as the product over its zeros and product over its poles and multiplied by an entire function. So if you know all poles and zeros, you can uniquely determine the partition function up to an entire function. Uh, so uh, I want to apply the quasi-normal mode method to large D black holes. So uh, let's review what large D black hole is. So this is the um, this is the Schwarzschild metric in D dimension. So for any R greater than R naught, that is held fixed. As I take D to infinite, the metric is flat. But when I'm very close to the horizon, the metric is non-trivial, and it deviates from flat space only in the thin region of thickness R naught by D, where R naught is the horizon radius. And it turns out all the interesting physics is encoded in this region. Uh, so, in order to apply, so I want to apply the quasi-normal mode method to the large D black hole. So this is the uh, field equation for gravitational perturbation around Schwarzschild black hole, and this equation can be studied. Uh, so here, V s is the potential corresponding to either tensor vector or scalar perturbation, and it, this equation can be studied perturbatively order by order in one over d expansion. And uh, we found that the solution satisfying the boundary and periodicity condition occur only for specific mass parameters of order one and higher order. So, um, so I can use the quasi-normal mode method to write down the partition function as the product over order one poles and product over order d and higher poles. But it turns out that in the large d limit, only order one poles contribute. It's not evident from this equation, but this diagram uh, makes it clear. So suppose if I have some order one poles here and order d poles here, so this is for finite d in m uh, tilde plane. So if I increase d, this circle will get bigger. And uh, these order d modes would get pushed further out. And in the limit, as d goes to infinite, I'll only be left with order one poles. So uh, yeah, so the partition function is just, so this is the result, basically. And since the order, uh, our calculation showed that the order one poles uh, basically correspond to modes that live near the horizon, so it uh, encodes information about the black hole and the near horizon geometry. 
And uh, yeah, so only vector modes contribute after gauge fixing. And future work would be to analyze the large T limit from heat kernel perspective. Thank you. Uh, no, it's not. It's it's a meromorphic uh, function of. It's not m squared. Basically, it's it's some function of mass, but it's not m squared. So it, it comes from the boundary condition. So the boundary condition is analytic in m tilde, not in m. So yeah. So I'm Daniel Renard, and I work with Shaoling Chi at Stanford, but today I'm going to be talking about some recent work in progress with Jess Riedel and Kurt Monkheisinger. link So quantum systems that we're interested in often have some sort of effective classical behavior, by which I just mean that usually there's some operators that approximately obey some classical equations of motion. But if you're just looking at some microscopic quantum Hamiltonian, it's not always obvious which operators or which states actually evolve in this classical way. You might just say something like, oh, it's the coherent states, but the coherent states of which operators? And if you don't believe me that it's not always obvious, well, if you hand me a holographic CFT, it might not be obvious to me that there's actually some operators in that Hilbert space that correspond to some gravitational bulk fields that evolve classically in some limit. But that's sort of a crazy example. There's even way more ordinary examples, non-holographic theories, in fact, ordinary systems around us, where it's not obvious what the right classical variables are. For instance, if I hand you a spin chain Hamiltonian that actually manifests some classical hydrodynamics, it might not be obvious just looking at that Hamiltonian what the right variables are to manifest those dynamics. So to try to find the right sort of semi-classical variables to use, our idea is to look at the entanglement growth. So let me explain that. If you start off with some state that's evolving semi-classically, then it'll evolve in time for a while, but eventually it'll develop a lot more long-range entanglement. And in some sense, it won't, be evol it won't look like a semi-classical state anymore. But in fact, for a lot of systems, it'll still be able to be canonically decomposed into a sum of relatively few states, each of which is individually behaving semi-classically. And this might just seem like a lot of words, but it actually has a lot of application in quantum many-body simulations. So we have a, an idea for how to decompose a state that looks like this state on the right into a sum of states that are evolving semi-classically. And if you can do that, then you can get huge speed-ups in quantum many-body simulations. The reason is that the reason it's hard to simulate a many-body system is because of the entanglement growth. But if your system actually has some effective classical dynamics, like a lot of the systems we care about, then a lot of that entanglement growth will just be due to this sort of structure of the state. So if you can find some sort of decomposition like this from first principles without needing to know those semi-classical variables in the first place, it could offer a huge speed up. And even in the past week or two, we've been looking at some simulations on spin chains, and we've been applying a method like this, and it seems to be working really well. Um, so I hope I can, I could show you some plots, but they just came out. If I have another minute left, I'll try to be a little more specific about what this procedure is for finding this canonical decomposition since I didn't say anything. Well, when you have a system that's evolving in this semi-classical way, then, as, then parts of the system will become correlated and you'll develop some long-range mutual information between different sets of degrees of freedom that are acting effectively classical. So if you look in your state for that long-range mutual information, and then you look what the variables are whose correlations are giving rise to that mutual information, then you know that those are like the variables that are acting semi-classically. I could try to go through this in an example or two. So then we decompose the state according, in such a way that they have re relatively definite values of those variables. And that's how we produce this decomposition and then do the simulation speed up. Thanks a lot. Um, 
Um, this won't be true forever, say after the system's fully thermalized and scrambled, but for a while in natural systems, it'll be the case that, so, so imagine that you do, imagine that like we in this room, that you do a quantum measurement of a spin, and based on that result, you look at it and you do, you walk that way or you walk that way. So if you analyze this system as a closed system in a pure state using the sort of typical von Neumann picture of what happens in a measurement, from the global perspective, you'll see that you generate some mutual information between uh, your center of mass degrees of freedom and other degrees of freedom, and that the state looks like a sum of states like this. They, they definitely are. I uh, in, avoid that term since it carries a lot of interpretational baggage. <laughs> Branches, yeah. It's, it's a theoretical prescription for doing it that in some numerical systems, in some systems we can simulate numerically seems to work. That's all. I won't say it's, yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers to the opportunity to present this work here. My name is Anna, and I will talk about symmetries and degeneracies of open spin chains. And this work is based, uh, this presentation is uh, based on a work with Professor Rafael Nepomici at the University of Miami. Well, the building blocks of integrable quantum systems are called our matrices. And if somebody gives you an R matrix, and you, if you substitute an integrability machinery, you get an integrable closed spin chain whose main feature is that in addition to the Hamiltonian, you obtain an infinite set of conserved commuting quantities. Well, let us uh, think about the Heisenberg closed spin chain, for example. Uh, consider this spin chain with uh, n sites. In, in, any si in any site, I can put a spin half or minus half. Uh, and each spin can interact only with Perth's neighbors. Uh, this model is isotropic. The R matrix is rational, so the symmetries of the spin chain are the same symmetries of the R matrix. So we can use SU2 symmetry to understand degeneracies in the following way. Like we can simply diagonalize the Hamiltonian, so we got some degeneracies, like here, but we, we can use group, group theory and we will get the same degeneracies. So we are explaining the degeneracies using group theory. But we are interested in generalized to anisotropic integrable spin chains. And these spin chains are built from trigonometric or matrices instead of the rational that we had before. But if we consider bo periodic boundary conditions, we don't have any nice symmetries. So we need to consider an open spin chain. And consequently, we need to take into account uh, some boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions we are inside these K matrices. So now we put in integrability machinery the R matrix and the K matrices, and you get an integrable open spin chain. The simplest uh, model, the XXZ, was uh, shown to have quantum group symmetry UQ, UQ A1, A1 by Pasquier and Saler. But in general, trigonometric or matrices are, con are related with affinely algebras, G, I call it G hat. And in the literature, you can find uh, some um, diagonal K matrices for G, G hat that depends on uh, a discrete parameter P. What we realize is that this parameter P can be re directly related with the nodes of the Dinkin diagram. More specifically, the spin chains have, have quantum group symmetry corresponding to removing the pith node of the Dinkin diagram of G hat. So let us look at uh, this example, uh, AA twisted. If we, so we have nodes from 0 to 4. If we remove the node 0, we will get uh, the Dinkin diagram of B4. Uh, so we have uh, UQ before quantum group symmetry, but if, if we remove the first, the node one, we have a B3 thinking diagram here and uh, a C1 here. So we have UQ B3 times UQ C1, and we can do the same for the other, the other um, um, diagrams. And uh, the the important point is that only by looking at the thinking diagrams, we can know which kind of quantum group symmetry to expect. And 
Something that should be intuitive, I think, is that if we just take a random matrix, then we don't have high degeneracies. We only have like one, 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 like it's really uh, unlikely to have high degeneracies. So since we had uh, high degeneracies, we have some hint that should, should have some symmetry, and we explain these symmetries uh, using quantum group symmetry. We explain these degeneracies using quantum group symmetry and some additional discrete symmetries that I, I cannot, uh, I don't have time to show. Thank you. I just have one very detailed question. Okay. So you mentioned pure geometric and elliptic cases. Uh, is there a similar story for rational or matrices or open dimensions? Or is it only elliptic and pure geometric? No, uh, I, I mentioned like, uh, uh, rational first. What? And then. Uh, Trigonometric, an uh, open case. Uh, the lipid, uh, we didn't, we didn't look anything about. No, my question is, you mentioned rational at the beginning. Yes. When you got to open chains, it sounds like it was then trigonometric. Yeah. So yes, because uh, um, periodic boundary conditions for trigonometric break the this uh, this nice symmetries don't appear if you consider a closed pin chain. We don't, we don't have this like really high degeneracies and this. For trigonometric, uh, if you consider trigonometric or matrix, or matrices. I was really trying to ask whether in the rational case there is an integral There is, yes. Yes. Thank you. Mm, any more questions? Thank you. Uh, hello. This time I will talk about the sense square deformed CFT. This work is cooperated with Shida Wen, also from MIT, working on condensed matter. Okay, we started the quantum dynamics of sense square deformed CFT on an open subsystem from zero to L. And the sense square deformed CFT is as following. Assuming you have a uniform theory with such a Hamiltonian, and then you can deform the Hamiltonian like this. Here, H of S is the local energy density. Uh, the original motivation for, the, for this modified sense square deformed theory is in numerical calculation, but here we just try to study its dynamics. In critical point, the sense square deformed theory can be described as a conformal field theory on curved space time with a metric like this. By the safety technique or by numerical simulation, we found that the sense square deformed CFT has continuous spectrum. And we started the dynamics of this sense squared CFT by the quantum crunch, means we start from the original uniform Hamiltonian and take a crunch to this new Hamiltonian. And we use the entanglement entropy to measure the system. And we found that the analytical, and the analytical calculation and the numerical simulation match very good like this. And you can also see that at late time, the, the entanglement entropy behave like, like a log of t. Oh, this is time and this is entanglement entropy. So that means that even though, we can say, even though the lattice is in a finite system, but the system, but from the entanglement entropy, you see that in the system looks like, uh, it, it behaves like an uh, in fact, infinite effective lens. And we, we can also consider this kind of generalized uh, Hamiltonian. And with these two Hamiltonian, the original Hamiltonian and this new de uh, deformed uh, SSD Hamiltonian, we can also use it to play, play as a flow create problem. Flow create means that assuming you have a system, you drive it periodically. And you, with this two Hamiltonian, you can, you can drive it. And by tuning the time of this, this two Hamiltonian, then you can have different uh, phase. For example, the system can heating and can also non-heating. Actually, this, uh, in, each, in each period, this, uh, this operator uh, has a, 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 uh, is related to an SL2 transformation. And the elliptic uh, of SL2 transformation is correspond, correspond to non-heating, and the hyperbolic heat of, of the group corresponds to heating phase. And there are also some open questions. First, 
the holographic description is straightforward. Maybe a, a little subtle is about the heating phase. And the second question about the stability for the non-heating phase. For example, for example, in, in, in the non-heating phase, if we turn on some interaction, whether this, period, uh, whether this oscillating behavior is stable. And the third question is about random driving. We also try to drive the system randomly, and we found that the system always heating. But an analytical explanation will be good. Yes, thanks. The laser pointer is right here. Right is advanced. Left. Okay, hi. Uh, Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk here. I'm Andreas, and I will talk about my June paper with uh, Thomas and Henri on the Wilson line perspective on Schwarz and correlators. So, uh, at least since yesterday, you all know the Schwarz. We study this because it's a dual to one sided JT gravity black hole, and as such, it describes the universal low energy limit or minimal content of any theory of 2D quantum gravity, such as SYK. Now, the nice thing about the model is that it is exactly solvable, and the correlators can be calculated. And this has been done by several groups. Now, our goal was to pinpoint the operators in JT gravity that are dual to uh, these operators in the Schwarzschild network calculated. And we'll do this by embedding JT gravity in topological gauge theory, more particularly SL2RBF. And this is just a dimensional reduction of a more familiar story of how ADS3 gravity is embedded in SLT Archon Simons. Now, the gauge theory perspective here is particularly useful since we all know the operator content of Chern Simons. These are nodded and boundary anchored Wilson lines. And indeed, in the paper, we prove uh, via direct pattern manipulations, but also explicit calculations of the amplitudes on both sides that boundary anchored Wilson lines in JT calculate by locals in the Schwarzschild. And here I will basically review the bill calculation, i.e. solve JT gravity on a disk by embedding its states and operators in SLTRBF. So the guiding tool is a drenveld sokolov Hamiltonian reduction, resulting in the following states and wave functions. Now the bras and cats on the right-hand side are states in the SLTR Hilbert space. The bras and cats on the left-hand side are the spanning the, the Hilbert space of JT gravity, the two uh, yeah, sets. And their states are defined on an interval. Notice a matrix element on the right hand side, which is an SLTR Irab matrix element. There were the different bases chosen for the bra and the cat. And so these are not your, what you would usually call matrix elements of the group, I guess. And all this is implied by the Dunwald circle of Hamilton reduction. Also, there's a prefactor is really important it's normalization. Then the operators, uh, as I said, are uh, boundary anchored Wilson lines in SLTR BF, uh, which are evaluated just to SLTR matrix element, well, specific ones. And a subset of these become uh, operators in JT gravity the following. Uh, also, the Hamiltonian of the theory is uh, just a Casimir of SLTR supported on the boundary and diagonalized by the EDAP eigenstates. And now that we've identified the states and operators of JT as states and operators in SL2 RBF, the calculation is basically reduced to uh, similar calculations as amplitudes of Wilson lines in Yang, 2D Yang Mills. And this boils down to a Hamiltonian evolution of uh, intervals to patches of the disk because the states are defined on intervals crucially. Examples are the following. Now, the initial and final states here. Uh, represent local punctures or defects to be inserted in the disk amplitude. And the pattern derivation in the paper shows that the Schwarzschild operators correspond to a disk with no punctures, and we have to choose these initial and final states accordingly. Okay, so let me just flash the results. Basically, these are just uh, Schwarzschild results, and the takeaway here is that the uh, bulk JT gravity calculations precisely reproduce the Schwarzschild amplitudes, though providing these with a uh, yeah, geometric a group theoretic and yeah, bulk interpretation. Thank you.
Yeah, I guess there is. From the perspective of the VF theory, is it fair whether there could be additional saddle points for the case where the boundary is a circle? You mean, what do you mean with the boundary is a circle? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, this is laser pointer up here, and then right is advance, left is previous. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, hi, and thanks to the organizers. Um, I will talk to you about how to obtain Jacques Tidebaum theory from entanglement dynamics, and this is based on work in progress uh, with Hermann Verlinde. Uh, so consider a two-dimensional CFT in a vacuum state, so that's any state whose stress sensor can be written as a Schwarzschild derivative of the light cone coordinates. Then the contribution of right moving degrees of freedom to the entanglement of an interval with this length is given by the famous formula, the log of the length over the UV cutoff. Uh, but now when you add a boundary at z is zero, then the same formula as before now gives you the full entanglement across a point P that is labeled by the light cone coordinates x plus, x minus. Uh, so in that sense, uh, by adding a boundary, the entanglement has become a local field in the sense that it depends on the coordinates of a point. And we can ask now about its dynamics. Um, and it's, it's easy to see that the equation that is obeyed by the entanglement is this equation. Uh, and we recognize this as the Liouville equation, expressing that the entanglement is the Liouville field that lays this hyperbolic metric on the space-time. So this equation expresses that this metric has constant curvature. Uh, and now we can repeat the same exercise for the modular Hamiltonian, which is given by this formula. Uh, so by taking derivatives with respect to x plus and x minus, we find that these are the equations that are obeyed by the modular Hamiltonian. So in this slide, I can now summarize the entanglement dynamics equations as a set of equations that are obeyed by the entanglement and the modular Hamiltonian in a two-dimensional CFT with a boundary. Um, and on the right-hand side, I write them in a more transparent form, uh, which is obtained by expressing these equations in terms of the natural metric that's imposed by the entanglement, the hyperbolic metric. Um, so these are the equations that now I want to compare to the equations of motion of Jacques Teitelbaum theory, which is the 2D Dilton gravity theory with the following action. So the action has the metric, a dilaton, and matter fields, where the matter part of the action is independent of the dilaton, so that when you vary with respect to the dilaton, that imposes a constant curvature of the metric. That's this equation. And then varying uh, with respect to the metric components imposes these equations on the dilaton. And on the left-hand side, I rewrite these jacques Heidelboim equations in terms of the conformal mode when we're working in conformal gauge for the metric. And then by direct comparison with the entanglement dynamics equations, we now see um, that the um, entanglement dynamics equations are equal to those of Shakif Tidelboim with the entanglement mapping to the conformal mode and the uh, modular Hamiltonian mapping to the dilaton. So in conclusion, the entanglement dynamics of boundary two-dimensional CFT are those of Shakif Tidelboim gravity with this mapping. Uh, and let me also comment that another context where this identification appears uh, is the construction of the space of intervals in a two-dimensional CFT, which is called kinematic space. So we can also say that the dynamics of kinematic space are those of Shakif Tidelbaum gravity. And in that context, there's, there's also uh, a boundary. And in that case, it's the time slice of the CFT, which becomes the boundary of the kinematic space. So I'll end there. Thank you. Oh, 
Oh, sorry, yes. Um, it's because there's a minus sign in these mappings also. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. In the end, that doesn't matter. That's just uh, because if you want to write the, the Jacques Teilbaum action, it will only depend on one, uh, one parameter with a length scale. So you cannot compare it to other length scales. So it doesn't matter that it's small in, turn, in the sense of the CFT, if that makes sense. Um, Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, so let me thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. So I'm going to be talking about these two papers done with Shumit Das, Antal Jaiviki, and Kenta Suzuki. So the goal of uh, my talk is to outline the steps in order to reproduce the SYK spectrum and the bilocal propagator, starting from some three-dimensional model. And I'm going to restrict myself to the strong coupling limit, uh, to the infinite coupling limit. So just to remind ourselves about the, uh, SYK, some aspects of the SYK model, consider this SYK Hamiltonian for Q interacting fermions. <clears throat> and uh, if we perform the disorder average at large n uh, to define a bilocal field and then consider one over n fluctuations around the saddle point of this bilocal action and uh, expand that uh, fluctuation field in terms of the modes which diagonalize the quadratic kernel, we basically get this equation which uh, the solutions of which gives the uh, SYK spectrum. This was given by Maldasena Stanford and also by Kitaev. <clears throat> so once we have the bilocal uh, action, we can calculate the propagator. So this is the answer which we get. The z nu's are some uh, linear combination of Bessel functions which diagonalize the, uh, the quadratic kernel. And these RPMs are the residues with this, of this quantity. And the PMs are the solutions of the SYK spectral equation. So for Q equal to four, we can calculate this RPM exactly, and this is the expression which we get. And uh, uh, for arbitrary Q also, we can calculate it, and we get some uh, harmonic number, uh, some expression in terms of harmonic numbers. Uh, I haven't put them here because they are pretty long. <clears throat> so now that we have some, some understanding of the SYK spectrum and the bilocal propagator, like we would like to ask if we can uh, come up with a 3D model to reproduce these quantities. So let us consider this, uh, uh, this metric, which is conformal to ADS two times an interval. And uh, if, you, if you consider a single massive scalar field in this background in this following non-trivial potential, uh, and we would like to determine this constant V such that the uh, spectrum is reproduced. So we impose Dirichlet boundary conditions on this field phi at the ends of the interval. And if we restrict ourselves to even modes, uh, uh, we can perform an integration by parts to write down the uh, scalar field action in this form. But this D0 is just the ADS2 Laplacian plus a uh, hypergeometric operator in the third direction. <clears throat> So uh, in order to diagonalize this operator D0, we carry out the following mode expansion, where these Z nu's are the same Z nu's which appeared in the SYK propagator, and these phi k are the hypergeometric functions which diagonalize the third direction. And it, it turns out that if we choose this particular value of V, we exactly reproduce the SYK spectrum. <coughs> uh, so once we calculate, once we get the uh, spectrum, we can get a little more ambitious and try to calculate the 3D propagator. And indeed, if we calculate the 3D propagator, we get this form, which is like which looks very similar to the SYK by local propagator. And uh, the CPM is just given by the product of the normalized wave functions in the third direction at the center of the interval. So for Q equal to four, again, we can compute this CPM. And miraculously, this turns out to be related to this RPM, which was appearing in the SYK propagator. And uh, indeed, the propagators like agree with each other 
up to just some numerical factor. So for arbitrary Q, we couldn't perform this uh, like analytically, like the CPM calculation, but we could verify numerically to high precision that for a fixed Q, the 3D propagator and the bilocal propagator are just proportional to each other. Uh, so there are some nice consequences of this at large Q, and uh, like this can help us get some space-time interpretation of the SYK model, but I don't have time to talk about that. So I'll stop here, so thanks for listening. <clears throat> So it is kind of a back calculation, like, um, so uh, we, we chose the potential in such a way such that, like, if you, if you impose some boundary conditions on the phi k's, which were the modes diagonalizing the third direction, the SYK, propagate, uh, the SYK spectrum was reproduced. So uh, it, it, it involves some kind of back calculation to get, choose the form of the V. Um, you mean like uh, uh, consider like interacting uh, action of the scalar field, which uh, like um, no, uh, I believe there has been some work done by uh, Gross and Rosenhaus on this kind of stuff, but we haven't looked that at yet. Like we just considered the free field action. Next, left yeah, Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here. I'll talk about my recent work with my advisor on ADS to delta on gravity from reductions of some non-relativistic theories. Drew dimensional delta on gravity theories coming from dimensional reduction of higher dimensional gravity theories coupled to matter have been studied extensively in the literature. Recently, it has been in a toy model of deleton gravity with varying deleton ADS2 solution. It was shown that the back reaction effects break the local reparameterizations of the boundary time. And in later studies, it was shown that such leading effects describing the nearly ADS2 theories are captured universally by the Schwarzian action. And also in the SYK theory, we know that the leading departures from conformality are also governed by the Schwarzian action. So our goal was to see if we get nearly ADS2 and Schwarzian we were in generalized theories of dilaton gravity coming from reductions of charge black brains in Einstein Maxwell as well as hyperscaling violating Lipschitz theories in, theories in higher dimensions. First, in four dimensions, charge black brain are solutions to Einstein Maxwell theory, and in the near horizon limit, there, sorry, in the extremal limit, the near horizon geometry is ADS2. Now, compactifying the transverse two dimensions as a torus and doing a dimensional reduction, we get dilaton gravity in two dimensions which has ADS2 as a solution with constant dilaton. Now turning on perturbations to the metric and the dilaton, we see that the metric gets corrected at the same order as, order as the dilaton, but this all happens at quadratic action in the bulk, uh, quadratic part in, in the bulk action. Now compactifying the given socking term to two dimensions and expanding in the perturbations, we see that the leading contribution comes from the perturbation in dilaton, and which gives us the Schwarzian action. Our second case is charge hyperscaling violating Lipschitz black brains in four dimensions. These are solutions to Einstein Maxwell scalar theories with additional gauge field, where the one gauge field and scalar field sources the non relativistic background, while the other gauge field gives the charge. These solutions are stable. The null energy conditions and the vanishing of the second gauge field gives constraints on the Lipschitz exponent z and the hyperscaling violating exponent theta. Now again, in the extremal limit, these charged black brains have ADS2 in the near horizon geometry. And upon doing the same toroidal compactification, we get generalized theories of dilaton gravity scalar, where now the scalar field is coupled non-trivial to the dilaton, as well as we have a mixed potential for the dilaton and the scalar field. But the, this two-dimensional theory admits the ADS2 solution with constant dilaton, as well as this constant scalar field. Now worry here is if this non-trivial coupling with this dilaton and this mixed potential will somehow affect the stability of ADS2 and the Schwarzian. To see that, turning on the perturbations to all these fields, we see that the ADS2 solution is indeed stable for the constraints on, constraints on Z and theta mentioned earlier. But this again happens at the quadratic part of the bulk action. From the 
compactification of the given socking term and expanding in the perturbations, we see that the leading correction comes only at the linear order in dilaton perturbation, which gives us again the Schwarzschild action at leading order. So we recover the jacket et album theory at linear order in dilaton perturbation and a generic massive scalar perpetrating on the ADS2 background, which is this mode here. Now there are a few case subcases. The one of the one subcase which is important is when z equal to one, theta equal to non-zero, where this zeta mode becomes massless, we have massless field propagating, and this doesn't decouple from the metric equation, and so linear stability analysis is insufficient here. So currently we are investigating this massless mode case further, just to mention, a certain class of uncharged hyperscaling violating Lipschitz theories with z1 theta non-zero arise from reductions of D2 brains. Thank you. Hi, I'm, oof. I'm Alex Draker, and this is going to be a talk about ongoing research I'm doing with Xiaoliang Qi. Oops. Essentially, as we learned today, the out-of-time order correlator, in a certain sense, is noticing that the average rate of momentum of an infalling particle grows exponentially in time, at least in a black hole background. What this means is that when we have a boundary theory with lots of complicated internal interactions and certain other things, we're gonna have some sort of quantity that's gonna grow exponentially in time, and that's gonna reflect this kind of bulk direction. So, like most problems in physics, we should first try to answer our generic question for the simplest toy model possible. And so that's why I'm gonna restrict attention to SYK's Hamiltonian, which has a kind of a generic all-to-all -all internal interaction structure. So in SYK, you can show that the out-of-time order correlator literally measures the average size of an operator as a function of time. And what I mean by average size is something we talked about earlier this week, that I can think of decomposing my operator into operators of different sizes. Another way of thinking about this is organizing by weight or energy. And that in a certain sense, we literally have this kind of wave function that we square and we get this average size. And you can show that the out-of-time order correlator is literally going to measure this for us. So why does it grow exponentially? Well, the idea is that we have kind of our one dangling generator, our, our flavor, our color, whatever you want to call it. And our interaction Hamiltonian is going to then make that into three. But then now that we have three dangling generators, we have three different locations upon which we can evolve it. And this structure essentially grows exponentially and leads to that kind of growth. But if we only understand the story at infinite temperature, which is what the previous statement was about, we don't really understand what's going on. So essentially, we can kind of ask the question about this real you know, out-of-time order correlator, which is what the chaos bound is honestly about. And as we know, such a thing can't grow faster than an exponential with a rate of 2 pi over beta. But what this is saying is that this operator right here, rho psi rho, can't, its average size as an operator can't grow too quickly, in fact, has to slow down as we cool the system down. So what we'd really like to do is we'd like to fold these rows against the psi and kind of normalize it out and then see what's left. So we do this, and the answer we find is that the kind of size distribution for this row size row operator naturally decomposes into two pieces. We have this one piece that entirely comes from psi, this kind of static, heavy background piece, and then we have this leftover kind of pro piece that's not just row psi rho and then get rid of the rows. In fact, it starts at a length much longer than one. And it actually looks almost exactly like a wave packet falling into a classical black hole background. So let me be more precise what I mean by that. I mean that if we literally take the size distribution for row psi rho, take out the rho part, we have something left over that in the strong coupling limit will become almost exactly a bulk to boundary propagator. So let me just pause there for a second. That's nuts. I just have quantum mechanics with internal interactions, and all of a sudden, I have an operator, and I let it go, and it looks like it's falling exponentially into a near-horizon Rindler region. Uh, and by the way, since this is a distribution, I can calculate the first moment. And in doing so, I was able to 
essentially, sorry, I should say we, we were able to uh, produce new expressions for the four-point function at all couplings at large Q. So we have an expression that interpolates between weak coupling and strong coupling in the large Q limit for all possible locations of insertions of the operators. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Not again. <laughs> Large Q, for now. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, that's actually, this is more like a hope. So what we actually find is that this thing's operator distribution, this kind of thermally smeared operator, has a piece that essentially entirely comes from row, and then it's the whole dynamics are gonna come from folding that against this kind of probe small piece that is initially small, but falls exponentially in time. So this kind of suggests that there might be a simpler set of operators that we can use at finite temperature than what we've been working with. Is that based on numerics or your large Q formula? Or? Both. I wouldn't, I wouldn't write anything here if I didn't check it numerically. Uh, thank you all for coming. Today I want to, is it on? Is it on? Yeah. All right, good. Uh, today I want to talk about the interesting connection between graph enumeration and the SYK model. So the central message I want to convey is that the SYK model generates a hierarchy of graph enumeration identities. So I'll first describe the graphs and state the enumeration identities and briefly mention how the SYK model generates them. So consider two P labeled points on a circle and then connect them pairwise with p cores. Here's an example with four cores and eight points. And we call these diagrams core diagrams. We begin with a simple question. How many different core diagrams are there with two p labeled points? This is equivalent to sorting two p distinct objects into p pairs, and the answer is simply two p minus one double factorial. And here are some examples for small p. Here's a much more non-trivial enumeration. The total number of core intersections among all the core diagrams with two p points is given by this, oh, sorry, is given by this quantity on the right. This might look elementary, but it's actually non-trivial to prove. It depends on the series of machineries developed by uh, these mathematicians. So my claim is the SYK model provides an alternative proof and actually gives infinitely more such identities. It turns out that the correct language for generalization is the so-called intersection graph. So we can translate the core diagram to an intersection graph by doing the following. We represent each chord by a vertex and then connect to vertices by an edge, if and only if the corresponding chords intersect each other. So take this one, sorry. Take this one as an example. The core diagram has two chords and one intersection. So the corresponding intersection graph has two points and one edge. And in terms of intersection graphs, the previous core intersection identity can be translated to the following, which says the total number of edges among all intersection graphs with p vertices is given by this quantity. Now my claim is the SYK model generates the following. The first line just reproduces what we had. And the second line says, the total number of triangles in all the intersection graphs is given by this quantity. And you can keep going. And the remarkable thing is the right-hand sides are all very simple looking. Okay, here comes the definition of SYK model. It describes a Q-body interaction among n different Majorana fermions. And the, uh, the couplings are Gaussian random. When Q is even, this is just a normal bosonic Hamiltonian. But when Q is odd, H should be interpreted as a supercharge. Now consider the moment, which is um, H raised to the power of 2P, then you take trace, then you do the Gaussian average. There are two ways of doing the large N expansion. First, you can apply the Vick theorem, and then do the large N expansion. 
it turns out the large n coefficients are uh, the total number of various intersection graph components. Or you can first do some analytics and then do the large n expansion. And it turns out um, the large n coefficients are just explicit polynomials in P and Q. Then you can do a matching. Then you can prove the uh, aforementioned uh, enumerations. Now, in the case of supersymmetric SYK model, the idea of matching also go through. But the details are a bit different, resulting in the following identities. Um, they are very similar to the previous ones, except with this common grading factor. And the right-hand sides are even simpler. OK, since I think I'm running out of time, I'll just leave the summary here for you to read. And thank you for your attention. It's basically commentary. So I, I can't really try to explain it um, just by talking. So it's uh, it, it's some complicated commentary. Maybe not that complicated, but beyond explanation by talking. So I'm sorry. Hello everybody, my name is Yoav. I'm going to talk about revealing the black hole interior using the SYK model. Uh, I did this work together with Rami Brustein and I'm going to explain what do I mean by the title. As an introduction, consider the SYK model in the limit of small temperatures but not too small. In this case, the reparameterization symmetry is explicitly broken and and the explicit breaking is described by the Schwarzschild action, the same Schwarzschild, the Schwarzschild action of the reparameterization function f. This same Schwarzschild action describes the. It, it arises in two-dimensional dilaton gravity models, where the time on the boundary capital T is described by the Schwarzschild action, and it allows we we can. Um, well, the, the Schwarzschild action has bounded solutions, and one such solution is drawn as a Penrose diagram. An observer on the red curve will see um, only a part of the, of the spacetime, and the rest of the spacetime is a black hole, uh, the gray region. And the purpose of my talk would be to perturb the SYK model in a way that, when interpreted gravitationally, will lead to smaller black hole geometries. To do so, consider the following J operators, SK, where K, K runs from 1 to J. Uh, psi here is the Majorana field. And uh, this operator can be diagonalized. Its eigenvalues are plus minus 1. And uh, this, the eigenstates can be, this can be called spin states. By measuring J, J such eigenvalues, one can construct a perturbation V where epsilon is a small dimensionless number and SK is the measured values of the spins. And this perturbation gives rise to a correction to the Schwarzschild action that when interpreted gravitationally leads to the following results. Uh, we, we can solve a certain equation of motion that reproduces the result by Kirkul and Maldesena, where instead of moving along the original uh, red curve, you will move along the blue curve. In this case, there is no black hole. While if you consider small perturbations, epsilon is smaller than this parameter, and the number of spins you measure is smaller than, than n over 2, um, you will find that you will move along this bottom uh, blue curve and you will see only, and this geometry is a smaller black hole with respect to the original geometry where there is a part of the spacetime that is exposed that was in the black hole interior 
of the original black hole. In this sense, I mean revealing the black hole interior. Um, so, um, an additional details are that this, the expectation value of the perturbation is negative. Um, the amount of exposure delta tau, which is drawn ov over here, is the small parameter. And when you fix epsilon and, and you measure more and more spin states as, you, as j grows, also um, the amount of exposure delta tau grows. So thank you. So I'm Henry, and I'm here to talk about uh, complexity. Um, one problem or one challenge with any proposal that relates uh, complexity on the boundary to some uh, bulk quantity is that it's very hard to independently compute the complexity of pretty much any quantum mechanical system, even a finite dimensional one like uh, SYK. So we need a sort of strategic retreat uh, from this problem. And I will describe how if you restrict your attention to a finite subgroup of the possible unitary operations that you can perform on your quantum system, then we can say uh, some rather precise things about the complexity that we can't uh, in the more general case, although we might hope that they could also be true. So uh, to do this, we're going to make some connections with the math literature. Uh, in particular, we want to introduce this notion of a Cayley graph. So given any group G that's finitely generated, uh, we can associate to this a graph where the vertices are the group elements, and there's an edge between two group elements, uh, if and only if, uh, you can get from G to the other element by multiplication by S, where S is an element of the finite generating set. So we want to think of G as some subgroup of the unitary operations, and we want to think of S as the simple gates that uh, we can build up our quantum circuits with. Now, once we have a Cayley graph, we can ask for a metric on this uh, group just uh, defined by geodesic distance uh, on this graph. And uh, we can study particular examples. For example, uh, we can restrict our attention to the possible, uh, all possible classical reversible computations that we can perform on n qubits. This is a finite subgroup with an extremely large order, um, two to the n factorial. Uh, we can also consider other examples uh, because the permutation group has a very complicated uh, Cayley graph structure. So here's a very simple example where we consider rotations by an angle 2 pi over 3 acting on some qubit uh, in, say, the x direction and the y direction. So the two colors on this graph correspond to the two possible uh, directions in which we can rotate the qubit. So don't worry too much about the details. The point is that we can isometrically embed this Cayley graph into the Poincaré disk. So there's a sense in which this geometry is negatively curved. So more generally, we can ask about uh, negative curvature on a graph, and this is uh, formalized by the notion of delta hyperbolicity, which basically says that uh, triangles in the negatively curved spaces look more like the ones on the left than the ones on the right. Uh, more formally, if you take any point on a triangle, you can find um, another point on a different side of the triangle at a distance less than delta. So this formalizes this notion of uh, negative curvature. Now, another thing that's interesting about this notion is that it's related to the average growth of complexity uh, as a function of time in a random circuit model. So this is basically the graph that uh, Lenny uh, showed us a few a while ago, uh, except that uh, in the blue curve is an, an exact computation at large n. So we have a very surprising feature, which is that at some exponentially large time, there's a phase transition where there's an actual discontinuity uh, in the rate of complexity growth. And this is related to this delta hyperbolicity. It turns out that triangles below uh, this scale, so triangles smaller than the phase transition scale, have a delta of order one, whereas they have an exponentially large um, delta for times larger than uh, two to the k. So this may have some uh, interesting holographic uh, implications related to firewalls. 
Uh, and uh, so I just want to say that if you like uh, precise sort of statements, but you also like complexity, uh, check out the paper. Thanks. What the? Ah, sure. Uh, yes. So, if you. Ah, okay. Right. Uh, this orange curve is this bound that you and Adam always draw, where uh, you say the complexity grows for a long time and then it maxes out at its value. And then this blue curve is what you can get by doing some exact computation where you're considering a random walk on this uh, very large permutation group corresponding to classical. Uh, random classical uh, operations, random reversible classical operations. And actually this phase transition is related to some um, very interesting sort of statistical physics of percolation on some uh, erdos rainy thing. So uh, check out the paper for some, yeah. Yes, yes, uh, there's a discontinuity at the red line, which I've drawn in red to suggest that it's related to firewalls. Uh, perhaps. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the exact computation has a discontinuity in it. Yeah, the, the orange curve is a bound, and it was conjectured that uh, the bound is almost saturated. Yes, in the second derivative, in the second derivative, yeah, yes. Uh, no, I think... Uh, um, I, I think that uh, most black holes uh, have very high complexity, so if you think that yeah, I mean, we should discuss about this, uh, but So uh, good afternoon, everybody. I want to start by thanking the organizers for setting up this wonderful school and for letting me present a recent work. Today I'm going to comment on a couple of articles. Uh, the first is titled uh, Black Holes Complexity and Quantum Chaos, and the second, in collaboration with Pavel Caputa, is called Quantum Computation as Gravity. So let me start with the context. Uh, we have a relatively new approach to quantum complexity developed by Nielsen. This is a fundamentally geometric approach, and we, uh, we are tempted to think that it is related somehow to gravity. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, the recent holographic complexity proposals, which usually state that the, there is uh, some uh, space-time object which is directly related to the quantum complexity of the microscopic state. And uh, we want to understand how uh, such classical objects can describe uh, such subtle uh, quantum aspects of the state. So, uh, Needless to say, as uh, Lenny was uh, discussing before, uh, the quantum complexity field is, um, is plagued by many different problems, both technical and conceptual. And uh, one might be inclined to think that uh, advances in this field are basically hopeless dreams. Our claim today is that uh, this is not the case, that there is a way to avoid such problems, and that actually it turns out to be a very sensible, simple, and uh, physical way to, to do so. Our proposal uh, in these uh, both papers to proceed is to use uh, symmetry transformations as quantum gates. So in this scenario, gates are uh, unitary representations of certain uh, uh, elements of a certain symmetry group. And therefore, a protocol, a unitary protocol, defines a path in the symmetry group itself. Uh, you can call it a group protocol. Then it is very simple to convince oneself that the Nielsen-type complexity actions are what are called in the mathematics literature conjoint orbit or geometric actions, which were developed by Kirillov a long time ago. This is, in more physical words, these are basically actions for particles in a, in a group manifold. The nice thing of this approach is that it is valid for strongly interacting theories, even for CFTs, for quantum field theories. It is indeed valid for, for most uh, quantum systems, or at least we can consider it, and uh, that the, the choice solves most of the problems. So let's see a couple of uh, uh, applications. Uh, the first, uh, the simplest example in, uh, with immediate uh, uh, applications 
uh, it's to consider, it appears when considering the following question. What is the computational cost of a boost of the linear momentum? It is, a, it is actually following uh, uh, the steps, it is actually a trivial computation to, to convince oneself that it grows exponentially fast with the rapidity of the boost. And this has a direct application in black hole physics, given the fact that uh, time translation in the bulk uh, near the horizon uh, are, are basically given by boost, and therefore, uh, initially, basically, perturbations, uh, infalling perturbations in the black hole have complexities that grow exponentially with time with the maximal Lyapunov of exponent. The second not so simple example is when we consider the Virasoro group. In this case, uh, or, or two-dimensional CFT, in this case, protocols are series of, uh, of conformal transformations which are, which are series of, uh, basic, of the pheomorphisms of the circle at its time, um, basically given by a function of two parameters, the time and the, and the, and the uh, angle in the circle. The geometric action, the complexity action, turns out to be this Schwarzian uh, type action, which, which turns out to be uh, equivalent to the Virasoro geometric action, which also is known to, uh, which can be rewritten as Polyakov two-dimensional gravity. So this is a precise example in which uh, complexity is computed by a gravity. Uh, well, first notice that th these actions appear uh, very naturally as the induced actions in the context of ADS-3 CFT2. And uh, so this is an explicit example in which uh, uh, gravity, gravity actions compute complexity and uh, classical solutions to GR uh, codify the optimal protocols in the complexity manifold. More, general, more generically, actually for any system, our results suggest that uh, sensible and workable uh, notions of complexity are given by coadjoint orbit actions. And with this, I would like to finish. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this, is, uh, this is actually the, I think the simplest way to see that uh, the, uh, there were arguments by, by Lenny and collaborators, and uh, then they have been reproduced by subwaves that uh, um, that complexity that there is a, before growing like e times t, it grows uh, uh, during the, during a, before arriving to the scrambling time, it grows exponentially fast with the maximal weapon of exponent. This this that, this uh, computation doesn't need back reaction. It, it, it is it is just. As trivial as this is, of, of course, if you, you can compute it in other way by including back reaction and then using the proposal. But here you don't need that. It's just plain uh, quantum field theory in the trillion space. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. It's been a, a really wonderful school, and I hope you're all enjoying it as much as I am. And I will talk about this work that I did with uh, my supervisor, Jose Barbon, in Madrid. And uh, you know, I, ha I have like four whole minutes to talk about this, so please, guys, interrupt me, ask me questions. You know, <laughs> uh, we have plenty of time. Okay, so I'll talk about terminal holographic complexity and uh, what do I mean with this, with this fancy title? Well, uh, what I mean is that I will talk about uh, singularities. Singularities are kind of mysterious objects in physics. We think that we can understand some of the time-like ones in string theory, but the space-like ones are, are harder and it's believed that uh, one needs uh, non-perturbative physics to resolve them. And uh, there is, regarding them, there is an old proposal by Penrose uh, that there should, there should exist a way to characterize uh, singularities which makes manifest uh, some notion of uh, arrow of time. And so in a realistic cosmology, not like this one, but maybe like this one, uh, one expects that the future singularity is full of black holes and therefore is uh, kind of more disordered, more chaotic, much more complex than, than an initial freeman russell -Walker, walker singularity. Uh, so what we speculate here is that, so Penrose proposed that there might be some notion of, of um, uh, gravitational entropy measure in this. Uh, what was speculated here is that maybe the correct uh, notion is not complexity, but not uh, not uh, entropy, but rather complexity. Okay, so complexity we already heard about uh, about this uh, several times today. It's a notion of distance in Hilbert space, uh, either measured by the length of a quantum algorithm or the size of a tensor network. And there are uh, several a couple of holographic proposals that recover. Uh, the phenomenology, so-called action complexity and volume complexity proposals. I will just focus on, on the first one. And if you stare at this diagram long enough, you'll notice something funny, which is that uh, this wheel of the wheat patch goes all the way, you know, on a highway to hell, right, the, towards the singularity. 
Uh, and this should be suspicious, right? Because uh, this is effective field theory, and we should not trust effective field theory there. Uh, however, when when calculates this, uh, what, what, what one sees is that this piece that uh, gives you the, con the contribution uh, from the singularity is not only finite, but actually very relevant. And it's, it, this, this uh, makes uh, holographic complexity uh, the first quantity ever proposed that picks another one contribution uh, from a singularity. And this is interesting. So what we wonder is, the, can we say something more generic about these singularities that, that does not depend a lot on, on the embeddings? So we try to, to, to find a way to address these singularities, to define uh, some quasi-local notion of complexity to them. Uh, and we just assign this, uh, this kind of uh, past domain of dependence uh, patch. And uh, we define dynamics under a nesting of, of this sort. And uh, we couldn't prove anything in total generality. Uh, but we tried, uh, we, we just computed uh, this quantity in several different, qualitatively different scenarios. And, well, I cannot go through them because uh, I don't have time, but uh, so the moral is that uh, we arrived to, to some common features. So the first common feature is that uh, in all these examples, uh, there is monotonic growth of complexity, meaning that uh, singularities defined in this, in this fashion always tend to, tend to increase complexity. And the second one is that uh, there is a notion of extensivity, meaning that the George Gibbons Hawking piece uh, can be isolated to some uh, coarse graining procedure of these uh, singularity complexities. Uh, and when you calculate for all these examples, uh, it gives always uh, finite quantities, except for uh, these uh, uh, Freeman, Robeson, Walker complexities in which uh, uh, this, this term is zero, which reminds us again to this, uh, this Penrose criterion that is supposed to distinguish between very symmetrical singularities and generic ones. Uh, so that was all, we just uh, had this definition of this quasi-local notion of complexity that has uh, some, we postulated that the, 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 it has some universal features, that it, it might be related to the Penrose criterion, and of course uh, there are many open questions such as the very definition of complexity in the continuum limit, also we studied some more exotic uh, uh, space times and BKL singularities and so on, but uh, I'll just leave it there and thank you. Okay, so uh, the thing is, so, BKL, so the BKL theorem, what basically what it tells you is that uh, you can regard any singularity uh, as, a, as, a, as a series of Kastner singularities. Okay, and we, we, computed the, we computed one of the examples that we did was indeed uh, the Kastner solution, and, and the contribution here is indeed finite. However, there is an interesting twist to the story because uh, when you follow uh, step by step, the procedure of uh, Bielitsky, Kalatnik, and Lipschitz. What well, you'll see is that there is some rescaling of the induced metric in those uh, in those successive uh, chaotic Kessner uh, space times, and in in the end, it seems like uh, it tends to zero. Surprisingly, we don't understand this very well, but uh, we did make some calculations around it. You can see them in the paper. Cool. So, hi guys. I'm Richard. I'm from Stanford. Um, I'm going to be talking about complexity equals action with stringy corrections. Um, so, Javier sort of stole my thunder a little bit, but um, complexity equals action has a very strange uh, thing about it in the proposal that Lenny, uh, Lenny and friends published, which is that you integrate all the way up to the singularity. For at least for neutral black holes, um, and that on the singularity you have to plug in a uh, Gibbons Hawking York boundary term, and so this should maybe scare you a little bit. Um, GR doesn't breaks down near uh, singularities, um, so why are we allowed to do this? And in the original complexity equals action paper for just the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, the reason why this works essentially is that the Ricci scalar of ads Warshall is independent of radius, so nothing, it doesn't blow up at the singularity, and the volume measure goes to zero, which gives you a finite answer. Um, but that's, well, we know there are corrections to Einstein gravity, and so one question that bothered that I was interested in is what happens with these corrections? Um, do they change it, and more importantly, does it stay finite? 
Um, so to nail home why this is an issue, I have a pretty simple toy model. Um, it's the simplest theory of gravity you can think of, more or less, which is or higher curvature gravity, which is gauss binet gravity in four dimensions. Um, it's so trivial, it's completely topological. It's just a number, basically, once I evaluate it. Um, and so it can't really affect the rate of complexification, being a number. But if you do the complexity equals action calculation, the bulk term gives a cubic divergence coming from the singularity piece. Um, and that's strange because we just argued it should give zero total contribution, but you're saved by a corrected Gibbons Hawking York piece evaluated at the singularity that gives you the exact same divergence with the exact opposite sign that cancels everything and gives you zero. Um, that's pretty miraculous. You could have easily have imagined it not being that way. It's fairly fine-tuned. And indeed, if you do the same calculation for the uh, Gauss-Binet corrected complexity in five dimensions um, for a neutral black hole, the bulk and boundary contributions don't disagree, and I get a quartic divergence. Or sorry, don't agree, and I get a quartic divergence. This should be compared to a paper that came out uh, recently by um, Ro Robbie and Hugo, who are at the conference but may or may not be here, where they did this for Gauss-Binet black holes, for charged black holes in Gauss-Binet gravity and got a finite answer. And the reason why that works is in a charged black hole, the wheeler to wit patch doesn't go all the way to the singularity, so you can't get a divergence from the singularity. Um, so I think the takeaway from this example is that for the action to be finite, when I integrate it all the way up to the singularity, I need a pretty miraculous cancellation, either in the action or in the sum of the two actions. Um, but a natural thing that one could complain about for this 5D Gauss-Binet gravity is that it doesn't really have a great holographic construction that I know of. So one could try... Um, doing it in a theory with a more concrete uh, holographic interpretation. And I saw Itor around to earlier today, so I'll say he gave me this idea. Um, so I wanted to include the leading alpha prime correction to n equals 4 super Yang mills, uh, or finite lambda in n equals 4 super Yang mills gets mapped into alpha prime in the bulk. Um, and the leading contribution is this lovely action that's a quartic in the vial tensor. Um, and if you do the bulk term, it's ugly, but it's not any harder. It gives you a 12 divergence, which is the worst divergence I've ever seen. Um, so now we need to do the boundary term. The problem is, as far as I can tell, nobody has ever written the boundary term, because this equation of motion has three derivatives of the metric in it, which doesn't appear in the Lovelock case. Um, so when I do that, I'll be able to see if it's singular or not, and I'm currently working on it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, um, that's entirely plausible. I don't know how to do that, but I don't see why it couldn't happen. Um, of course, they're going to be suppressed by increasingly many factors of alpha prime, but if you resum the series, maybe some cancellation can happen. That was actually Lenny's response when I told him this. <laughs> um. Okay. Here. Right is okay. to advance okay. last previous. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm a last one, so no worries. Uh, so first of all, I want, really want to thank the organizers for having me here. It is a, really a great pleasure. Uh, so I'm going to talk about time dependence of holographic complexity in gauss monoid gravity. So my name is Yu Xuanpeng, and uh, my collaborators are Yu Sunan and Professor Wong and Tai. This is my institution. Well. Uh, so this is just the definition of quantum complexity, and uh, if we want to do uh, gravitational physics, uh, there are mainly two uh, holographic proposals for holographic complexity. The first one is the so-called CV conjecture, which relates the maximal volume of a space-like surface connecting uh, two time slices of this boundary field theory, and the second one is the so-called CA conjecture, which is the on-shell action of this uh, Wheeler-DeWitt patch. So there are uh, some 
several uh, important properties of complexity which we can investigate in the holographic construction. Uh, for example, if you look at the time evolution of the complexity, uh, you may find that the time needed for the complexity to get to the maximum volume, uh, maximum value is much larger than the thermalization time. Here tau denotes the time and uh, the growth rate of complexity uh, obeys some, uh, this so-called Lloyd bound and in which this E const, uh, is the uh, total energy of the system. And uh, you can also look into the uh, whole time evolution of the holographic complexity and uh, you can draw uh, graphs like this in both conjectures. So our, our motivation is that uh, if you consider uh, higher curvature corrections in the bulk gravity, uh, that corresponds to some higher energy corrections from the string theory and on the boundary CFT, you may have deviation from the large N limit and the interaction of the CFT might be lower and you can expect the complexity growth rate uh, is suppressed. And uh, we, it is interesting to verify if this, is, uh, this argument is true. So uh, this is our model. The einstein gauss bonnet gravity contains the Einstein-Hilbert term, the cosmological constant, and the high curvature corrections. And we look into these static black hole solutions. So uh, this is one main result of our work. And uh, it, yeah, this, in this graph, the horizontal axis is the time. And the vertical axis is the time uh, derivative of the complexity. And uh, these different curves show uh, the behaviors corresponding to different values of the gauss bonnet coupling. And we can see that for larger gauss bonnet coupling, uh, we have lower complexity growth rate during all the times. And uh, we can also have this late time value of complexity growth rate. And this term uh, outside the parenthesis is just the Einstein gravity result. And uh, to look at the small Gaussian coupling corrections, we can find the suppression term. All right, uh, we can also compare our results to the results uh, obtained in the literature by using uh, CA conjectures. And uh, uh, this is a table and for a different uh, black hole horizon curvatures and uh, for a different time dimension, uh, space time dimensions, the results are here. And the uh, main conclusion is that for the CV conjecture, we can see more universal decrease due to the higher curvature corrections than the other conjectures. So uh, that's all. Thank you very much. It's four minutes sharp. Uh, the the bound violation. Uh, that's a very good question, but the question is that we don't know. So um, the reason is that for a CA conjecture, we uh, in the past we could not do the CA conjecture calculation through the whole time. So we could only do it at late times, and the late time limit saturates the Lloyd bound. Uh, during the full time, we need to calculate the uh, null boundary surface action, and that that was just unknown uh, before, I think, before uh, this June. So, yeah. So, so we just don't know. This can be a very good future direction. Thank you. Thanks.